Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff. This is a special edition of Real Crime Stories, and I'm your host, Bill Cannon, retired NYPD Manhattan North Homicide Sergeant. And today I have a most unbelievable guest. Her name is Barbara Butcher, and she was the chief of staff of the New York City Office of the Chief Medical Examiner for 22 years. And what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what that means. It means that she ran all the forensic science training programs. Uh, she was responsible for medical legal investigations, disaster planning, fatality management, WTC 9-11 victim recovery identification, which has become the, uh, the gold standard of DNA identification probably across the nation, if not across the world. Uh, missing persons. And also as a deputy director, she uh, uh, coordinated the 1993 bombing at the World Trade Center and also Flight 587, which resulted in 265 deaths, deaths, excuse me. She also responded, if that's not enough death, to the tsunami in Thailand where there's over half, half, a, half a million deaths, correct? About 260,000. 260,000 yeah. to try to help them with the identification of these uh, bodies uh, to give closure to the families. Anyway, what we're gonna talk about today, and when I first mentioned this to Barbara, uh, the Gilgo Beach homicides, I could see her eyes light up. So uh, this is a case that's in excess of 10 years old, uh, older in, in, uh, in regards to some of the, uh, the dead uh, bodies recovered, but the investigation is still what's known as a cold case. and it, whether all of the deaths are connected or not is a, a matter of argument, opinion. Uh, there's, there's not 100% science behind saying, oh, these aren't all connected or that they are all connected. So one of the things uh, well, that I would like to say, and I'm going to have Barbara talk, is that there was some connection with sex workers. And at least four of them right away, uh, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Melissa Bartelme, Bartelme, me, I think, of, Megan Waterman, Evelyn Costello, they were all escorts who had advertised on Craigslist. So that's that's a commonality. But when I really looked into this case, I also noticed that there were other two other escorts, Jessica Taylor and Valerie Mack, who were also escorts and were found in the same vicinity as these bodies. And then there is also a seventh, and that was Shannon Gilbert. But we'll discuss each one of these and how it relates to each other. But there's at least 10 to 16 bodies. And let me, let me have, this is Barbara Butcher. Let me have Barbara uh, speak in regards to this. Thanks, Bill. Um, and by the way, I wasn't responsible for the 1993 bombing. I was responsible <laughs> to investigate it. Right, exactly. I said, I said that incorrectly. So there's some humor in this show, even though we're dealing with a very serious topic. <laughs> of course. So this is an intriguing case. It's enormously complicated. Um, and it all started in uh, May, I think it was May of, of 2010. Shannon Gilbert was an escort who went out to uh, the Gilgo Beach area on an out call to a client. And she ran from the house, frantic, screaming, they're trying to kill me. She called 911. Her driver tried to chase her down. She went from one door to the next, banging on the door, calling for help, and she disappeared. So police did a search, a Suffolk County police, and they didn't find anything. But about what, how many months later? In December, about seven months later, an officer was doing a routine training exercise with his dog out on the beach area. And he stumbled upon four sets of remains. These are the four young, they're all small, petite young women um, who were found in burlap sacks uh, that were rotted away. And the remains were mostly skeletonized and they were found right near each other. So this triggered a search, which went on into the spring and then four more victims were found. Um, these were about just under two miles to the east of where the original four girls were found. So this next set of victims, it was two females, one male, 
and a little toddler, a little girl, probably around two years old. Um, then the search extends into Nassau County because this beach from Gilgo, Cedar Beach, uh, Jones Beach, they're all along Ocean Parkway. And they're all, they've all got uh, this area of, of really thick scrub, um, bush that's impenetrable. They, they had so much trouble getting in there to try and find these victims. But anyway, so they find two more sets of remains. Uh, in the Nassau County side towards Jones Beach. Interestingly, these remains were connected to others that were found back in the 90s. I think um, 1996, a set of legs had washed up on Fire Island in a garbage bag. Yeah. And they matched um, a torso found in Hemp near Hempstead Lake, uh, near Lakeview. So they keep finding remains. Now we've got, what, nine sets of remains. And then in December of 2011, Shannon Gilbert is finally found. Um, they found her clothing and then some, maybe a quarter mile away, I believe it was, they found her body. Interestingly, the medical examiner said that the cause of death was probably drowning and that it was probably death by misadventure, which means something near an accident. Right. They didn't count it as a homicide. Now, Michael Bodden, the private pathologist who, you know, is hired by families a lot, he, um, he did an autopsy or, or a second look at the autopsy rather and said that he believed her death was due to strangulation. And the fact that she was found face up kind of uh, belied- It me. lends credence to that sort of. Yeah, yeah. yeah because- Well, could I stop you just for one second? Sure. One of the things, and, and of course you look at this more of a, in a scientific way because of all the, the uh, scientific evidence. And of course, investigation is an art and a science, right? Mm -hmm. But the art of this, when you look at it, the four girls, they're all escorts. They're all Craigslist escorts. And they're all dumped near the same uh, place. Shannon Gilbert also is a Craigslist escort. Mm -hmm. And the other two girls that were found later on, Jessica Taylor and Valerie Mack, were also uh, prostitutes. And the commonality, of course, is Gilgo Beach. So yeah. obviously, the serial killer has some connection. Does he, in fact, even live around, live there? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because the Shannon Gilbert thing, I, I would still count that pretty much as a homicide. Uh, yes. Because it fits it fits the pattern. And we could go into later on, we'll go into MO and and um, uh, the, uh, what's the other thing? Not M MO and um, signature. Right? Yeah, signature. And, that will lend even more credence to this. But let me let you talk more about the science. I just wanted to lay that out there because yeah. I think there's seven bodies. Pretty much they listed as four that are, oh, these are definitely connected. But why can't, why aren't all seven connected? I think, frankly, all 10 are connected. Okay. Um, I think, you know, as you said, the, the four girls originally found were all Craigslist escorts. Now, and, and then so was Shannon Gilbert. They were all called out to Gilgo Beach by somebody and they were all murdered in a similar fashion. The signatures are very similar. So, um, first of all, Craigslist started in 1995. And as I recall, maybe you do, back before that, uh, there were escorts done not through Craigslist, but through escort services. They advertised in the back of the Village Voice. Right, um, right. And basically what that was, was a, um, uh, a switchboard. You had a manager who took the calls in requesting escorts and then assigned them out to their stable of, of workers, um, all through beepers and cell phones. So that, that brings up my first question is, since escort services started in the late 70s, 
And as I recall, anyway, not that I have a deep <laughs> personal knowledge, but I was offered a job. Well, your, beep is, your beep is ringing off the hook right now. <laughs> <laughs> I did actually get offered a job as, uh, as an escort, but I, of course, turned it down. <laughs> um, so you had a pension and uh, you had medical benefits. <laughs> So the um, so the, the fact that I think nearly all of the victims, everybody but the toddler, seem to be a sex worker, either through Craigslist or other escort services. So there's my first question to you as an investigator. How is it that police are not able to track? I mean, I can understand the Craigslist thing. All the calls went directly to the girls. But... They, the others worked for escort services. Why can't they go back to those folks, you know, make a public announcement? Anybody right. who ran escort services, switchboards, give us a call. Well, Why Barbara, I we think there's a lot, obviously a lot of, we don't have access to the case folder. There's probably a lot of things that we're questioning right now that they have in fact uh, done. You know, yep. like we don't know. I mean, look, allegedly the serial killer called Shannon Gilbert's sister a couple of times. Yep. And they tracked it once to like uh, Ma near Madison Square Garden, and I believe once to Massapequa, and then there was another call that was out east in Manorville. Right. So, and these are, look, you know, the serial killers, obviously, he's what's known as an organized defender, right? Yes. He's smart, he has a car, probably has a job. He travels, you know, he's willing to travel far to find the victim, you know. But serial killers get very comfortable with dumping someone in a specific area. And in fact, as you know, you study this stuff that they like to sometimes go back there to sure. relive the thrill of this body was there or this is where the person was killed. So there's a lot of things that, you know, we can, when you talk about modus operandi and signature. There's a lot of things that could be looked at also, which, you know, are great for these forensic files shows. But as an investigator, yeah, that may help uh, to uncover who actually did this. And yeah. one other thing, and, I, and, I may be, and I'm sure you were going to talk about this, but the four bodies of uh, uh, Marine Brainerd Barnes, Melissa Barthelme, Megan Waterman, and Amberlyn Costello were wrapped in burlap bags. Yes. And there was some connection with that, right? You want to talk about that? Sure. Um, there were a list of, of people that were so-called suspects or persons of interest in this case. Um, among them was a guy named um, James Bissett. He owned a local nursery out in Suffolk, I believe, and he was the, the region's largest supplier of burlap bags. Okay, that doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot. Anybody can buy a burlap bag. But interestingly, two days after Shannon Gilbert was found, he killed himself in his car. Right. I would love to know more about that. And I'm sure the I'm sure Suffolk County police do. Um, but what intrigues me about this case in particular is not just that these sets of bodies found along Gilgo Beach, but the fact that they connect to skeletal remains and legs and skulls found back in 96 in different areas. We don't have just the Gilgo Beach area. We have Jones Beach. We have Hempstead Lake State Park near Lakeview. And that's, that's Nassau County, right? Right. Yeah. And we have Manorville, the Pine Barrens. So remains were found in Manorville. And interestingly, the other portions of those remains are found at Gilgo Beach. So. Right. So when you talk about signature, yeah, there go lies why he would want to go back to Gilgo Beach is where the serial killer would be comfortable or get some kind of thrill of going right. back to that location. But did he originally live in Manorville? or in Nassau, and then move to the Gilgo Beach area, where he got very comfortable with, as I said, that very dense brush there along the parkway. It's abandoned. Nobody goes in there. Right. And as I remember, when the, when the guys were, were searching that area, they had to use a brush hog. It was so difficult. They couldn't walk through there. They couldn't get the dogs through. 
who are being cut up and hurt. And um, it, it's like thick brambles and, and really, really difficult to get through. So using the brush hog, they were able to clear some paths and get through. Did they also use uh, cadaver dogs? Is that how they initially yeah. found? Okay. Yeah. Those dogs were amazing. Uh, I, you know, I worked 9-11 uh, at Ground Zero and they were amazing at, at uh, Ground Zero. Yeah. I know, and it was it was really sad too. Some of those dogs got sick. Yeah, yeah. they cut their little paws and stuff. You yeah, know. yeah. Yeah, so, those dogs are great. Um, but you know what? What intrigues me is that this is a. I mean, we have a good picture of this this killer. We have a youngish male, uh, twenty to forty, let's say. He owns a home somewhere near that area. And that's not a cheap area. No, no, not at all. And he has a car, obviously. <laughs> and he can afford escort services. Now, some of the, the girls charged as much as $1,200 for an out-call visit. Some 500, some a few hundred. The price is varied. So we've got someone with a job and maybe a family, who knows? But he had to have an area that he was able to kill in. Uh, maybe a garage, maybe a little cabin somewhere, or maybe he lived alone. We don't really know. Right. We don't know much about him, but we can sort of build a, an idea of who this person was and make several suppositions about him. Um, we can go over some of the other persons of interest later, but well, Barbara, let me ask you one thing now. You said 20 to 40, but this goes back to 1997, so he could very well be close to 60 right now, right now, yeah, yeah right. Yep. Mm. Yep. Because this goes back further than people want to acknowledge, yeah. And I've heard some law enforcement people, you know, almost insist that this is more than one killer, you know, and. I think that there's more than likely, like you say, that no, it's one. It's one. Yeah. There's some there's some differences, and we can discuss that. But that doesn't rule out, you know, the one killer theory. You know. Yeah, I I was also I was um, at at one point I thought about a, a two killer theory because um, there were differences in some of the the murder styles. Um, I, I don't want to talk too much about evidence that hasn't been released because it's, you know, it's stuff that's probative. Sure. Least been used. But we know that some of the girls were dismembered and some were not. So right away, that makes you think two killers. We have um, three distinct areas where the bodies were found, most near the Gilgo Cedar Beach area, um, some in Manorville and some in Nassau County along Jones Beach. But if you look at the map, you'll see that this is more or less one continuous area mm -hmm. um, along Ocean Parkway. Now, Manorville is equally desolate. That's where you have the Pine Barrens. Nobody goes there except, um, I think the Grucci family does their, used to do the fireworks. their fireworks. Yeah. Is that like the last exit on the LIE, that area? It, yeah. It's the last exit before uh, Red Riverhead. Okay. So it's at, at where, the, where Long Island forks. Okay. Um, but it's also very desolate. So um, what, what, here's, here's what really threw the whole thing into a tizzy. I was thinking maybe two killers. But then the woman found in Nassau County near the Hempstead Lake, her torso... Um, revealed her to be a uh, African-American or mixed uh, African-American Caucasian female. Her child, a child of maybe two or three years old, a little girl, was found in the Gilgo area. Right, that's the toddler that they recovered. The toddler, right? yeah. Right, so that, that definitely has the connection there, that this could very well be the same guy, right. you know? And we has the African American woman who was recovered in Hempstead. Has has she ever been identified? No, she hasn't. No, no, and neither has her child. And you know, this brings up a whole another set of of scientific um, modalities uh, for investigation. And and again, 
I am not involved in the Suffolk County investigation. I don't work with the with the police there, and I don't know what they've done. Right. So, but um, there's a, a program called NamUs, the National Association of Medical Examiners Unidentified um, Persons uh, website. You go on this website and you can put in all the data you have on a missing person in your family. Medical examiners across the country and coroners have approximately 100,000 unidentified bodies. Wow. So they upload the DNA, they upload the photographs, the characteristics, and then the system matches that to the persons who are reported missing. So have all of these people, especially a young woman with a child, they have family somewhere. Someone somewhere knows of a little girl that went missing and her mother and the jewelry that they wore was very similar. The little girl and the mom had similar jewelry on and those pictures were publicized by the police. That should tell someone somewhere in this country, that's the girl I know and right. help identify her. Well, um, with these uh, genealogy sites, for example, I believe um, Valerie Mack, was just ID'd in May, right? Yeah, and uh, right. she's the first successful genealogy identification in New York State history, right? That's right, that's right. So it's like, you know, the chances that these people will be identified are pretty high. You know, I think it's gonna happen. Eventually, and, yeah. Yeah, and then maybe scientifically we could um, connect the dots a lot better if we can uh, find out I mean, if the woman in Hempstead turns out to be an escort, that's pretty strong yeah. evidence, right? Yeah. And you know, uh, besides the genealogic analysis of DNA, there's also partial DNA matching. And that is uh, very controversial. Um, it's not allowed in most circumstances. And that's when... Um, you remember that woman, uh, what was her name? Karina Vetrano, I believe it was. Yes. Young girl goes out jogging um, along maybe Long Beach, one of those areas. Well, I think it was uh, in Brooklyn. It was in Brooklyn. Yeah, it was in Brooklyn, the yeah. South Brooklyn, <laughs> down near the water. Oh, excuse me. I was near Howard Beach, I think. But Howard on the, Beach. On the line of Brooklyn. Right. Yeah. Right. Because the perp was from Brooklyn, I believe. Yeah. Well, they had a, um, a, a partial DNA match and, and they were, they had partial, partially developed DNA evidence and they were looking to do um, matches to the databases where you don't have a, an exact match, but you have a, a relative. Are you talking, like you're talking about familial DNA? Familial DNA, exactly. And um, I was educated yeah. once. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember going to the hearing of the uh, Forensic Science Commission, the State Commission, and uh, to see whether or not they were allowed to use that to help find a perpetrator. Now, you know, as a as an investigator, my my first reaction is, well, of course you can use it. Come on, it's ridiculous. You got to stop a killer here. You can't let this little girl um, her death go without getting justice. It's horrible. And then there's everybody from, you know, the ACLU and, and, and other groups who say, no, that's not fair to those persons who are related to the killer, but perfectly law by Innocent, law. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. It's no, so by the, I don't, these arguments really, it's almost like all the new technological advances that are coming across in law enforcement, they're finding some reason to say that uh, it's unfair to certain people. For example, mm -hmm. facial recognition. Right. They're saying it's not fair. Why? Because it's IDing the person that committed the crime. You know, it's like it's crazy. Uh, yeah. Predictive crime analysis. Yeah. What better way? And again, I'll I, I always quote her, Dr. Maki Haberfeld from John Jay. What better way of predicting future behavior than looking at past behavior? <laughs> I mean, very simple. What yeah. better way of predicting future crimes than looking at past crimes and where they occurred. So why is that 
not allowed. Or they're, they're trying to, you know, license plate readers, same thing. Oh, those. You, Barbara Butcher didn't do anything, but you're running her plate. And she has nothing to worry about. She's That's not right. wanted. She doesn't owe any summonses, you know. So what, what does she care? She won't even know. You know? Yeah. But they're trying yeah, to take I mean, all these tools away. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think everything should be done carefully. We don't want to open up a, you know, a, a wholesale investigation of the public. There needs to be a certain amount of oversight. But damn it, if you have a good clue, if you have a way of catching a, a, a vicious, vicious killer who might kill anybody you know, your family, right. why not use everything you have? So well, anyway. but look at even DNA with um, the statute of limitations. Yeah. And sex crimes. They found a way around that. That's they right. They indicted yeah. the DNA. How That's fucking right. was that? You know? That was, we don't that know was. who the purpose. Let's indict the DNA profile. And that's what they did. And so many people now are in prison because their DNA got indicted, right? Yep. I love that. I, I think that's too. one of our, our proudest moments. What a brilliant idea. Yes. You know, you, you're, someone was raped and brutally beaten nine years ago. So we're going to just drop it now. Right. Statue right. of limitation. Come on. Well, how much, <laughs> how about how many, much DNA just sat on a shelf because the municipality didn't have the money to process it? That's right. That's right. How that's fair. fair. That's just not fair. No. So, in whoever thought of that, and who I don't know who it was. I don't know. either. I don't either. Yeah. But it's it was brilliant. Yeah, that's somebody I'd like to talk to. Yeah. <laughs> um. So anyway, eventually, um, all of the victims will be identified through DNA. Uh, but is what are they doing with the DNA right now? I know that the New York City. Um, forensic anthropology team was called in to assist Suffolk County for the first four victims. And they did extensive anthropologic analysis. Um, there's a lot of findings in there that are really, really important. Um, all of them, you know, again, confidential, but uh, the DNA lab in, in, at the New York City Medical Examiner- Barbara, can I is, just, uh, just stop you for one second? Because sure. there's something very interesting about what you're talking about. And one of the reasons you, you as a professional, are so protecting this evidence is because if someone becomes a suspect, the police need to be able to challenge them with information that only they know. You know, or else you could get some wacko saying, oh, the Gilgo killer. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Let me ask yeah. you a few questions. All right. See you. You know, but you're right. So they have to protect. Certain evidence. I used to get crazy uh, in in New York City when the police commissioner would release really important stuff in a homicide investigation that yeah. we didn't want released. But he was like this: "Oh, we have to be, you know, transparent." No, you don't. They yeah. don't. Need, you know what killed me? Remember when that little Jewish Hasidic boy was murdered? Oh and God! The guy cut him up and put him in his refrigerator, and the public didn't need to know that. I know. I that know. was horrendous. Why did they have to tell the public that? There was no need for that. Nope. No. And no I just I wanted to put my two cents in there. And just yeah. No, I, I can... data, You know, and why evidence is protected or should be protected. So. Sure. So you, you guard evidence for several reasons, not just what, what you said, that you want to know things that no one else knows but you and the killer. Right. And then there are certain things that are evidentiary that you don't want your killer to get rid of. Right. Uh, sometimes they take souvenirs. If you know that, keep it to yourself. They call it They call it a trophy. A trophy, right. Yeah. So yeah. you're forgetting this, Bobby. You've been away from it too long. I know. I need to get back in there. You're getting the language of homicide. <laughs> yeah, I know. They keep a trophy. Yeah. Exactly. So those are the kind of things that, you know, we, we don't want to go into because they are so useful. But anyway, um, so linking the victims through DNA, like linking that mother and her little girl, um, the linking the remains that were found on Fire Island, that was a set of legs in a plastic bag, and they still had the flesh on them. So they were able to tell there was a surgical scar on the leg. 
Things like that are so important. Wow. Yeah. And then they're linked to a torso found elsewhere. Wow. This is just, it's all because of DNA that we're able to link all these cases, which is what makes me feel that it's one killer. Now, so here's the one piece of DNA we're missing, the killer's DNA. Right. Ordinarily, that's what we're interested in. Any trace that he leaves, notice I keep saying he, because mm -hmm. the idea that this could be a woman killer is absolutely I think out of the question. Right, right. Women don't really hire escorts. Um, it's it's been they are the escorts. <laughs> that's right, right. I mean, there there I, I there are some women who have hired male escorts, but to hire this many and kill right. them is a pretty far stretch. Yeah.